Let's pray again. Lord, just lift up this message to you and uh, the awesome responsibility of communicating your word. Uh, I just pray for wisdom. Um, and I just pray, Holy Spirit, to move in this place and just draw people to you like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. This particular psalm, uh, it has a lot of nostalgic value to me. Uh, I got saved in 1982. And uh, there was a, a, a Christian artist named Roby Duke. Anybody heard of Roby Duke? <laughs> Everybody of 40, above 40. Yep, heard of that guy. Um, he was incredible. And about this time I got saved, he actually put this word, this, um, this psalm to, to song, and I got to learn it through listening through him. And I remember vividly making this decision in my life in 1982 that I was going to be all in with this Jesus stuff. I got saved at a Christian concert, by the way. Music's extremely important to me, still is. I told this story to our men's group uh, last fall. I gave my testimony and that uh, I told him that I remember the decision uh, to follow him was all I'd ever hoped for, all I ever hoped to be. Um, I was ready, but I'd have to give up some of my beloved idols. Near the top of that list was my love of all things 70s and 80s in music. I was steeped in all the fine music of the early 80s, late 70s. And I remember the decision I made at that time it wasn't based on, um, you know, any grand uh, message delivery from the Lord. Um, I didn't feel the God necessarily leading me to give that up. Uh, for me, it was just a simple math equation. For me, it was uh, old life, old uh, music plus new life in Christ. They didn't add up. Um, by all accounts, I had just unloaded essentially all the sins that I had committed or could commit at the feet of Jesus and I didn't see any sense in picking up a bunch of rocks and putting in my new life backpack. Uh, I made this huge leap in um, my choice to uh, just listen to music that would honor the Lord. I made it long before I realized what it was. <laughs> I knew that God had taken my sin and tossed it as far as the east is from the west. And there wasn't any need for me to go back and looking for it, dragging it back up again. So I went looking for Christian music at the time. And oh boy. Sandy Patty, Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant. These are wonderful artists, proclaim the word of God. They're fantastic, but for a brand new believer, it's like hopping in an ice bath. I knew it was good for me, but wow, what a difference. And it was at this time that I fell to my knees and asked God to save Ted Nugent, because this is a rough transition for me. <laughs> this burden is too great to bear, Lord. I told my the men in our group that um, it was a lot like, you know, pushing the Ferrari off the cliff and turning around and have God tossing you the keys to an 80 Hue Buick station wagon, because that's what it felt like with Christian music at the time. Little did I know this new adventure of life with Christ was going to be pretty in intriguing, because a lot of the folks that I enjoyed listening to got saved. Uh, one of my favorite at the time was a guy named Kerry Livgren. He's the mastermind behind the group Kansas. He got saved and led a bunch of people to Christ all about the same time. And in no way my, was my decision to try to honor him in, in my one idol of music, in no way was that an attempt to impress God or impress man, because I wasn't that far from fast-tracking my way to hell, to be honest with you. I just knew that God had made me a new person, and some of the music I listened to couldn't mesh with that new man. I also developed appreciation for this, this uh, guy named David, who wrote the Psalm 34, wrote, wrote over half the Psalms. Um, and God calls him a man after his own heart. And when God labels somebody, you have to take notice. Um, in Acts 13, 22, it says that when he had removed him, Saul, we're talking about, he raised up David to be their king, whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Now, if you've read much of David's life, uh, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Psalms, you realize that David did a whole lot of stuff in his own will. <laughs> that's not part of God's will. And I think that's a good picture of us as well. And I spent a lot of years trying to figure out, trying to get my mind around David who can such a, have such a great moniker uh, considering all the nonsense he'd been involved in. I think the answer is in that verse. He did all God's will. To do his will is to be after his heart. And that's for us today as well. There are several things about David that stand out to me uh, vividly. One, he had a deep faith as evidenced in his battle with Goliath. Even as a non-believer as a kid, you know, you hear the story about David and Goliath. Secondly, 
the theme in David's Psalms are his impassioned love of the Word of God. Thirdly, he's always grateful. The Psalms are full of gratitude. Fourthly, he knew that God loved him no matter what. David is one guy who could lament, and boy did he lament. And in the bits of his despair, he could stand up and say, but you know what? God loves me. Remember, it was David that encouraged himself in the Lord when they'd come back from fighting in Ziklag, and the Philistines had annihilated it and kidnapped all their women and children and, and burned the town down. And everyone hated David because he was essentially in charge. And he used the words, I encourage myself in the Lord. That, that's a special guy. And lastly, he was truly repentant. Admission of guilt and asking forgiveness is, is part of the equation, but repentance, true repentance, is the rest of it. Psalm 51 is a psalm of repentance. And here's what it says. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from sin. I was thinking about making that verse my ringtone. Could you imagine that? My phone rings about 25 times a day. It really does. And it drives my family crazy. It drives me crazy. But about 25 times a day to, to recite that verse, that's about right as well. <laughs> Could you imagine? Have mercy on me, O God. Wash me according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, plot out my grand transgressions. Wash me thoroughly with my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Hello? 25 times a day. Wouldn't that work? <laughs> Let's take a look at the text. Verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. This is a very bold statement by David. He says, I will. This is determined. This does not need the approval or motivation of another, although later on he invites us to join him. We'll get that in a few verses. David is resolved to bless the Lord. The word bless in Hebrew can also be used for the word to kneel. This is a picture of respect and submission to God second half of that, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Again, David is making a declaration that he's going to give God the honor and praise due his name. Is there a way that we can bless God at all times to have his praise continually be in our mouth? I'm going to tell you this morning, the answer is absolutely yes, and I'm going to offer a couple thoughts on how we can do this if this isn't current in your life right now. Offer one, we have to get a grip on what he's done for us. Last time I got up here, I was talking. I said, we often live as though Jesus is part of a well-balanced life, and I want to address that a little bit tonight, too. This is daytime, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we'll address it today. We often create this line between what is called secular and what is called sacred. <clears throat> we have the Jesus stuff, and then we have life. It's two different worlds, and they seldom cross. Could you imagine Peter approaching Jesus and saying, you know, that loaves and fishes things, that was pretty neat, Lord. Um, by the way, how's your spiritual life? Because remember, at one point, Jesus was a carpenter. I imagine Jesus would look at him inquisitively and say, what do you mean? All things are spiritual for me. When I'm a carpenter, when I'm in the temple. For us, it begs the question, should we be compartmentalizing file folders of various areas of our life? Should I have a folder called spiritual, which is what I'm open this morning? Should I have a folder called church, Bible study, prayer, youth group, you know, all the Jesus hours of my week? And another folder called secular, where I compartmentalize my work, my entertainment, hobbies, purchases, you know, life. If you have this mindset, the spiritual folder is usually a very small fraction of the overall life and rest is mundane. And of course, we know that God's only interested in the spiritual, right? That's wrong. That was a setup. You see, when we give our lives to Jesus, all things are spiritual. It's true on two levels. First and foremost, when we receive Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit indwells us. The Spirit resides in us. Scripture tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And how does that work in file folder living? If the Spirit is present, when we are in our spiritual folder, where does he go when we're working? Where does he go when we're hanging out with friends? We can't separate the sacred and secular because the secular indwells us. I'm sorry, the sacred indwells us. We cannot check the Holy Spirit at the door 
when we make poor choices for entertainment. For example, Spirit, this movie's a little edgy, so we're just going to leave you here. Come back and get you later. It's not appropriate for you, like we're talking to a four-year-old. That's not possible. God's holy. He isn't going to watch the movie with you. He's going to watch you watch the movie. He's not going to listen to your music. He's going to watch you listen to your music. Jesus is not your homeboy. Is that what the cool kids say still today, younger guys? No. When did he stop? 1990? Sir. Okay. Jesus is our Savior. And as long as you believe there's a dividing line between the secular and sacred, here's what's going to happen. You're going to convince yourself that God is not involved in the other 95% of your life. If you're able to convince yourself of that, then Satan has had victory in at least one of three areas of his playbook. His playbook is found in John 10.10. 10. It says, Jesus says this. He says, the, the thief, Satan, has come only to kill, steal, and destroy. Those are his three plays. But I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Can you see how this trap works? If God's involved only when I'm at church, I pray before a meal, read my Bible. After this, the other 90%, well, that's my time. In fact, God's abundant life has been stolen and replaced and relabeled as secular. It kind of puts you in a no-man's land where you have too much God to enjoy your time, too much of your time to enjoy God. It's a barren wasteland. A lot of believers end up just staying there. I'm telling you, the Spirit wants to blaze in us, believers. We've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. He wants to blaze. We need to stop quenching Him. Is there a chance you'd be labeled a Jesus freak? Absolutely. But rather be labeled Jesus freak or have Jesus label you as lukewarm? Because one of these ends up with their mouth being spit out. <laughs> now, a practical level, what can I do to keep his praise continually in my mouth? There's several clues, and they're all found in this psalm. And for what it's worth, as you do Bible study, the best commentary on the Bible is always the Bible. Read a few verses ahead, a few verses behind, cross-reference. Uh, cross the Bible is always the best commentary on the Bible. Verses 3 and 4 read, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Okay, in those two verses, there's three words that are going to help us keep his praise continue in our mouth. The first is magnification. The second is togetherness, where I'm going to relabel it community. The third is seeking him. Three questions to ask yourself. What am I magnifying? Am I in community? And do I seek him? When we magnify the Lord, all we're doing is acknowledging truth. We're not creating it. When you look through a magnifying glass, the object that you're viewing, it's the same. It's just your perception of it changes. God is who he is. Magnification does not change that. It just adjusts our perspective. And too often we magnify ourselves. We suffer from depression when we magnify the troubles in our lives. We suffer from anxiety when we magnify the future, which for the most part is unseen and out of our control. It's kind of funny if you just write it down on a piece of paper and look at it, the notion that we will make ourselves sick over something that we can't control. It's kind of funny. Case in point for me is I hate to fly. I, I detest it. But I do a lot of it. It's not that I, I don't like flying necessarily, but the, I don't like heights. And planes are super high. <laughs> I know I'm using the word hey, but the, probably the right word is fear. I flew to Mexico over at New Year's, and I flew with my wife and son. We went down to hang out with some missionary friends in Tijuana. And right in front of me, in the seat in front of me, was this little girl, three-year-old, four-year-old little girl, just adorable as can be with glasses. I mean, how cute. You can't get any cuter than that. She was singing the alphabet song over and over and over. And it's the only song she knew. And it was still cute. She'd look about me once in a while, just kind of peek around the side. I always sit by the window because I'm wide. That's a good word. So if I sit now, I get crushed by the cart coming down. If I sit in the middle, people are kind of uncomfortable. So if I sit by the window, I can lean over to the window. So this little girl would peek around the corner at me from her window seat, singing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Cute as can be <clears throat> until we hit turbulence. Then she got hideously ugly. I like to be able to look out the window because I want to see where I'm going to land. If things go wrong, somehow it helps me. If I can know if it's over water, I can grab my seat cushion, whatever it is. But 
I do have a, me a, a method for handling turbulence that is tried and true. I lower my tray table, I grab it by the sides, and I just help the, the pilot. I mean, surely you do that as well. <laughs> Done this for years. Well, during this turbulence, I'm holding the tray table, the little girl's looking back at me, and I'm dying to yell at her, turn around, can't you see I'm trying to control this airplane? But instead, I just thought it really loud. Stewards would come by, sir, can you stow your tray table? And no, and you'll be great, you'll thank me later. And um, she didn't have a care in the world, that little girl, needed my family. Stacy actually throws her hands in the air and says, we, when, we, when the plane's about to crash, but I don't do that. One ounce of anxiety does not change the future. Jesus in Matthew 6 says that anxiety won't add a single hour to our lifespan. Let me ask a question. Is verse 1 possible? Because there are so many verses in Scripture that we read that we think, well, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. Well, wouldn't that presuppose that we have a God who's a bit cruel to give us such a grand passage knowing it's not attainable? I want this just to be a moment of brutal honesty. But Rick, you don't know my past. You don't know how hard it is to forgive, forgive her, forgive him. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know the things I'm doing now. A verse like this could never be for me. I'll bless the Lord at all times if my father this. I'll bless the Lord at all times if my mom that. If I wasn't so broken, if I wasn't so beat down, I'm going to point out verse 1 does not have a qualification. It says, I will. It's a resolve. Jesus doesn't want his people walking around wounded. Isaiah says, by his stripes we're healed. The context for this healing is sin. Sin is the issue. Sin is what separates from God and denied interest into eternity with him. And it's been dealt with once and for all. Any day that you don't have to pay for your own sins is a good day. Amen? When someone grabs your book of failures and cracks open to chapter one, the life and failures of Mark Barnhouse. Sorry, Mark, I had to pick somebody. Might be a big old book, it might be a two-page pamphlet, I don't know, it's none of my business. But I'll tell you this, the pages are illegible because they're blood-stained. You open that book, Jesus covers all of the nonsense, all of the sin, it's covered. God doesn't see it. Jesus' blood covers every chapter, every page, every sentence, everything you've ever done wrong, everything you can do wrong, covered. Any day you don't have to pay for your own sins, good day. Interesting fun fact, the word in Hebrew for salvation is the word yesha. It's kind of fun to say. In its purest form, it's the notion of open, wide, and free. You see, before salvation, we were anything but open, wide, and free. We were restricted, enslaved, and ultimately in bondage. But wait a minute. When I, before I was saved, I was free to do anything. I could do anything. I was a spiritual anarchist. That was not freedom. It sure it was for your flesh, but it's the open, wide, and freedom that the salvation speaks of is for your soul. This one word, yesha, for salvation has three tenses, past, present, and future. The past is the penalty of sin. Some of this is going to be uh, very elementary, but I don't want to take a chance of somebody not really getting this concept. Past is the penalty of sin. That's the sin we're all born into. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin are death, and if sin was a job, your paycheck would be death. Imagine putting in 40 hours, get your paycheck any day, death. Over time, over, extra death, just death. That's the wages. Present is the power of sin in your life today, the domineering weight of sin. Future is the presence of sin, period, gone, the elimination of it. These are often referred to in church as justification, sanctification, and glorification. In justification, we're open, wide, and free from the penalty. Jesus' blood took care of that. It's what I experienced in 1982 when I responded to the Spirit, tugging at my heart, and I, and I made the decision to receive Him as my Savior. In sanctification, we're freed from the power of sin. We're open, wide, and free from the power of it. We still sin, but now it's a choice. You're saying, well, wait a minute. I don't choose this addiction. Well, yeah, you do. If you're a believer and you're doing it, you're choosing it. 
because there are radical things you can do, radical things to avoid it that we're not willing to do. Power of sin. That's where I'm at today. And then glorification, the ultimate, is we're saved from the presence of sin. In heaven, there is no sin. I want to take a moment to let anybody know that if they have not surrendered their life to Christ, you're under the penalty of sin. God doesn't grade on a curve. Any, any sin disqualifies you. It's only through Jesus' blood that you can be free. And if you're thinking you don't sin as much as the guy next to you, and somehow that qualifies you, that's a horrible mistake because there aren't degrees in sin. It doesn't work that way. Imagine yourself in the line of 100 people. Let's say you're number 25 on the good side of the dividing line of the amount of sin in your life. Who are you to determine where the cutoff is? Let's say you're number 26 on the good side, and God, cut, God cuts off at 25. Sorry about your luck, but we have some nice parting gifts on your way to hell. That, that's a bad program. <laughs> Any sin disqualifies you. It's Jesus' sacrifice for your sins that qualifies you. So you need to get out of line this morning and get to the foot of the cross. It's a lot to take in, but if we grasp this yesha or salvation biblically, the huge majority of it are in sanctification stage of salvation. And with this explanation, you come across a verse like Philippians 2.12 that says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. I remember as a new believer reading that, and, and it kind of blew my concept of salvation out of the water for just a while until I grasped it. Because Christianity is the only faith in existence that does not require a ladder to attain God. I think about that. We don't have a ladder. We have a bridge. It's Jesus as our bridge, no ladder. And to come across a verse that tells me to work it out with fear and trembling... The notion of that is to take your salvation serious. Don't mess with it. It no longer has you in shackles. Now you can't work it out. I can't work out your salvation in fear and trembling. I got to work on my own. I got enough trouble of my own. But there's no reason we can't do this together. That's what community is all about. Speaking of community, you we're here today. So obviously we're in community. But a lot of us at times can learn the language of uh, Christianity. You can walk through that door back there. And you know the right things to say, you know, by your head, raise your hand, what have you. Healthy community looks like this. It's a group of broken people who have been redeemed and are willing to forsake their own woundedness for the sake of others. That's what we are today. Is community safe? No way. Is there a chance of getting hurt? Yep. <clears throat> when you run into a figurative burning house of another person's life, the chances of getting singed is real. I'll tell you what that doesn't look like. It's not uncommon for my wife, who's a fantastic cook, to make an amazing meal for somebody in need. Always includes a dessert. It'll be a plate of cookies or something like that. And I'll come in and look at that plate of cookies. I'm thinking, there's a lot of cookies for one family. I'll reach for one. <clears throat> I'll get the look. And I'll know those are for somebody else. Of course, my mind says, it used to be my mouth that said this. Now it's my mind. After 32 years, I've thought this out. And... But what I'm thinking is, that's a lot of cookies. And are, really gonna, are they going to count them? <laughs> I mean, could you imagine getting a call? Hey, your cookies were great, but they're only 23. You might want to check your floorboard. No, that would be rude. <laughs> but this is a cross I must bear if I'm going to participate in community. Speaking of other things that don't make sense to me, this has nothing to do with my sermon this morning, by the way. But let's just say a woman has 15 to 20,000 words she has to speak in a day. It could be any woman, no one in particular. And a guy, any guy, has to be told something twice. I mean, what's 7 to 15 words out of 20,000 vault? I mean, it could be any guy, like, say, a guy from France named Pierre or something like that. It can't be necessarily anybody in this room. But I'm just wondering what... 15 words out of 20,000? That's not that big a deal, right? Okay, it looks like I'll probably need a place to stay for the next couple of weeks, too. So let's get back on task here. Um, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, when holding community up to the light of Hebrews 10, Priority one is holding fast to the confession of hope without wavering. First and foremost, we need to cling to the hope that we found in Christ when we surrendered our lives to Him. 
that hope is manifest in word as well. We need to speak it. We need to share with others the beauty and wonder of having our sins forgiven. Secondly, we're to consider or to figure out how to stir each other up. That's the tricky part, isn't it? And some, some uh, versions render that as uh, spurring on. <laughs> You're reading a horse spurs? That's not very fun. Thirdly, we're to meet together. The Sunday morning is a small part of this picture. And lastly, we're in to encourage one another, even more as you see the day drawing near. Well, the day is drawing near. I don't know if you've looked outside, but we live in wacky land. Paul's audience at the time, they were talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. For us, it's death in general or the return of Christ. We're living in a dark time. It's no better time for us to shine. Ecclesiastes 4, uh, 2 says that two are better than one. Uh, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So just being together isn't enough. We need to encourage each other forward in our relationship with Jesus, forward to a deeper faith-filled walk with Him. I like to use a swimming pool analogy. A typical swimming pool has a shallow end and a deep end. They're usually separated right in the middle by a, a rope with a line of floats to keep it up. Same temperature both ends, same color, same water. But the pool graduates in depth, right, from one side to the other. <clears throat> And usually the rope is right at the point when the trans starts to transition to danger. And what do we typically find in the shallow end of a pool? Babies, toddlers, nurturing moms. That's all cute, but what else do we find? That's swim diapers. Okay, diapers are designed to fall apart in landfills, right? So what makes you think you're going to last in a swimming pool? Runny noses, kids that are using the pool as a toilet, all in the shallow end. It's safe and predictable. But it's all the full of your swimmates foul in the water. And I believe as followers of Christ that Jesus would call us out to the deep end. I'm fully convinced that the church in America in general is the church of the shallow end. The church of the baby pool. You won't see that in any signage. But that's where they stop. I think a healthy church encourages each to go to the deep end of the pool. To go deeper. To take risks. To jump into other people's lives and try to help to a mature faith where we choose to trust Jesus deeper. There's less control. I remember watching all of my kids the first time jump into the deep end of the pool. They stand on the edge. There's one of them who even mastered, Andy, I think, mastered jumping up and twisting in air and grabbing the side on the way down. <laughs> okay, that was an effort of faith on her part, just to even get on that side of the line. It's a beautiful thing. Exercising confidence, knowing that if something went wrong, I was going to help them. Or at least call their mom to help them. I didn't like water. God wants us to cross over the safety rope and trust Him with everything that He already holds in His hand. We need to go to the side and say, Lord, I trust You with all that I am, all that I hope to be, and I'm done with the baby pool side of the swimming pool. The third question you need to ask yourself is, am I seeking Him? And again, you're here this morning, so obviously you're seeking Him. I want to talk about a different level of that. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. 1 John 4.18 says there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. I can't bless the Lord all the time and continually have His praise in my mouth if I live in, in fear. Remember when Jesus breathed His last on the cross? You remember what happened back at the temple? That veil, that, that huge veil that represented a separation between God and man, the division between sinful man and a holy God was shredded top to bottom. That was glorious. God in the holy of holies, man outside that veil, is now able to enter in because of Jesus' death on a cross. It signified the opportunity for us to walk boldly into the presence of God because of his sacrifice. And in a room this size, I don't doubt that we have probably 10 people that walk up to this torn veil, look at it, and refuse to enter because it appears too good to be true. How is this possible that for nothing that I've done, I can enter in there? I can cross over this veil? The fear of punishment is still a possibility in your mind. You're still trying to pay for your sins. Beating yourself down for past mistakes. You've received God's grace, but you live in defeat because you're fearful that somehow your past is unforgivable. Your sin is somehow too great for Jesus' blood to atone for. This is a good day for you because 1 John 
It says, perfect love casts out all fear. Love and fear do not cross paths. They do not travel the same road. It was Jesus' blood that ripped that veil in half. And any effort on your part is futile. It wasn't then. It isn't now. It won't be tomorrow. Fear has to do with punishment. There is no punishment. There is no fear. Jesus took the punishment for your sins, and it's laughable to think that we can atone for our own. It's time to walk in. It's time to enter God's presence. Enjoy the peace of knowing that there's nothing you can do or have done that can keep you from Him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Does it not sound reasonable that we'd want to seek the Lord, this person who's willing to give His life so we can enter in? He initiated a relationship. He sustains the relationship. And ultimately, he's preparing a place to us to spend eternity in. I always find it fascinating that when you walk outside and look around at the beauty of this place we live, that took six days. Jesus has been gone 2,000 years preparing a place for us. It's going to be pretty remarkable. Again, we bring nothing to the table. There's nothing we can do to earn his love, respect, favor. It's all ours to receive. All we can, but we can do is walk out a life of gratitude and talk about this amazing gift. And isn't that what true Christianity is all about? It's just a life of gratitude, walking it out, sharing with people how grateful we are for what he's done for us. I firmly believe that every admonition in Scripture, think, think about this with me, every admonition, every rebuke, every correction in Scripture is based on an absence of gratitude. Because if gratitude is our motivation, it would change us radically. If we're grateful for our relationship with Jesus, we're going to show it. We're going to live it. We're going to talk about it. What does it look like to seek him? Jeremiah 29, verse 11, 13 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, there's a backstory to this, and it has nothing to do with the message either, but I'd like to share it because I think this verse is... is uh, is misunderstood, and, and I hope uh, just talking about it a little bit this morning will make this verse even more alive. <clears throat> Israel at the time is in exile. What's new? And a false prophet named Hananiah stands up in the crowd and says, in two years, the Babylonian exile will end and Israel be, will be restored. Well, Jeremiah stands up and offers a true prom prophecy, but it's not quite as appealing in verse 10, God says he would fulfill this after 70 years are completed in Babylon. That means the entire exiled generation that's in Babylon would die in Babylon. God gives them this directive through Jeremiah in verse 7. He says, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which, you have, which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, prospers you prosper. They wanted to be told their suffering is going to end soon. Who doesn't? Instead, God's plan for them was to stay right where they were to help prosper the nation that enslaved them. Isn't this where we are today as a church? This land is Looney Tunes. Can you imagine what this world will look like five minutes after God pulls all the Christians out of it? And it's not like that movie. I don't know the name of that movie that shows some semblance of civility. It won't look like that. It'll be pure anarchy. It's Christ in us that holds this place together right now. The principle of, instead of complaining, let's make it better. If our country is blessed, we're blessed. If our church is blessed, you're blessed. If your kids are blessed, you're blessed. Sorry for the mini-sermon within a sermon, but I, I think there's so much more to that passage that we can glean from it. <clears throat> now, with this verse in proper context, yes, he does have a wonderful plan for us and a future and a hope. That plan may play out now or later, but in the meantime, we need to bless those around us. It's with understanding and anticipation that he has great plans for us. The notion of with all your heart. You will seek me and find me when you search with me for all, with all your heart. There's stories of people that have tripped over gold nuggets. I've read about them. Just out for a walk. There's a group of three guys, I think, in Australia. I just read about recently that um, they were having a barbecue. Some place they weren't supposed to have a barbecue, and they found a nugget worth $400,000. So they busted it in three pieces and put it on Craigslist. Well, not only did they lose their gold nuggets, they got fined for trespassing. So what a bad day. So yes, you can trip over a nugget, but the concept here is the idea of mining for gold. It's investment of time, intent, affection. To find him is not like trying to find your car keys. 
you know, the relief from the earlier inconvenience of not being able to find him. It's more like this. Imagine the first guy, the first human ever that walked up to the edge of the Grand Canyon, speechless, just in awe of the beauty and the grandeur of the canyon. There's no way you'd walk up that and say, nice ditch, and then go back home. You'd be overwhelmed with the beauty of that place. You'd try to take it all in. You couldn't. You'd be compelled to climb to the bottom of it, explore the river, the animals, the different colors, the sounds, the smells of the evergreens. There'd be so much to take in, your sense would be overwhelmed. There'd be no way you could keep that to yourself either. You see, the first sight in all its intensity is just beginning. When you seek Jesus, there's a lifetime of exploration in getting to know him and learning to trust him. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear me glad. Galatians 2.20 says this, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then Galatians 5.24, And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Romans 6.6. 6. There's going to be a pattern developing here. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. In Romans 6.12, do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Here's a pattern. It's the fact that anyone who has surrendered their life to Christ has to reckon themselves dead to sin. Sin no longer has free reign. It's hard enough to do in general, but even harder when we have these different folders of life that I talked about earlier that separate God's stuff from flesh stuff. I mentioned earlier that my musical past didn't mesh with my Jesus future. I was too young in my faith to, to really grasp what that looked like at the time. For me, it was a simple math equation, like I said. It just uh, new life, old music, they didn't work together. Again, I can't work out your faith in trembling. I'm not called to. That's your job. But I do want to give out a warning. If you're saved and you're still parading the flesh in the name of Jesus in front of this dying world, doing your best to blend in, you're misrepresenting the heart of God and the power of His transformational power. At the end of the day, no one's fooled. The first victims are always your kids. I hate to say that, but it is. The kids see you through the facade. They often make their decisions about whether they're going to follow Christ based on your relationship with them. They see the folders. And yes, there are external influences. I get that. But sometimes we have to do radical things to rescue them. I mean, it might, it might, you might have to homeschool, move, put your foot through your TV, whatever. It might have to be radical. We're talking about salvation. Jesus died to save our souls. He didn't decide to save our flesh. Remember when Corey called this our body a meat suit? I thought that was pretty appropriate. <clears throat> when our flesh boasts in the Lord, the world sees right through it. And contrary to popular 21st century Christianity, our best life is not now. Our best life is in eternity where there is no pain, no suffering, no want, no fear, no grief, and no sin, which is the root of all that grief. Eternal life is best. We know throughout Scripture that God is not impressed with the flesh. Paul reckons it dead. God did not recognize Ishmael when he told Abraham to take his only son Isaac for a father-son walk up Mount Moriah. But the tricky part for us is we see flesh all day long. This is our common denominator. It's our perspective. We feed it. We water it. Brush its teeth. Comb its hair. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. It gets wrong when we exalt it. When we feed it things that are contrary to the spirit that dwells in it. When we exalt it above the needs of others around us. And lastly, when we try to impress God with it. That's, that's laughable. It's like grabbing a warm cup of coffee on a miserably cold day like today and exalting the cup. So enamored with that cup that the coffee gets cold and it's a total loss. God needs us to die to ourselves so we can be useful to Him. And dying to self is hard because the flesh throws temper tantrums like a two-year-old. It's like the checkout line in a grocery store. You're ready to check out of this mess and both sides lined, floor to ceiling with stuff that the flesh wants, the little flesh. <laughs> they start by asking, then grabbing, then comes a tantrum. I'd often tell my wife early in our marriage, once again, I don't, talk, I don't say these things anymore, 
that, you know, I'd take a bullet for you. You know, that's how deep my love is for you. And it's easy to say, if you're a man, because we all, all men have superhero genes, you know, some of them are dormant, but we all have the gene, don't we? Finally, about 20 years in, I think I said something like, you know, I'd be willing to jump in front of a bus for you. And she said, you know, that's all good and fine. I do the same thing, but can you empty the dishwasher once in a while? <clears throat> I was crushed on two levels. First of all, I have to take the bullet. That's my job. I have the hero gene. And secondly, superheroes don't do dishes, right? <laughs> Listen, if you have to put on a cape at home around the house to help your wife, no one's going to tell. Whatever it takes. And a note to all you gamers in the room, taking somebody out on a video screen, that doesn't qualify you as a hero. You want to take something out, try the trash. You want to assassinate something, try the pile of laundry you walk over. Split some firewood, shovel the neighbor's driveway, some real stuff, measurable stuff. Bless those people around you. The flesh does not die easy because we are all very efficient in flesh CPR. Well, here's a remedy. Instead of dying, how about we redeem the flesh? Let's make it better. Then we can have our best life now. Here's what that sounds like. Tell me if you've heard any of these. You're better than that. You have to believe in yourself. Follow your heart off a cliff. You need to have more self-esteem. That's what's really missing in your life is esteem. You need to esteem yourself. Then you can love others. You can't love others until you love yourself. Are we really better than that? Should we believe in ourselves? I'll tell you some of the older saints in the room, think back to when you believed in yourself. <laughs> some of the mistakes you've made believing in yourself. <laughs> How can you esteem yourself when you're supposed to be dying to self? There's a pastor in Edinburgh, Scotland. His name's Mez McConnell. Rough human being. Here's a story. Abandoned by his mom at two. Abusive stepmother, alcoholic, gambling, addicted father. He was arrested at 12 years old for assaulting elderly people. At 16, he's arrested at a nightclub after stabbing two people. <clears throat> he sat down for an interview in World Magazine. Here's some of the questions. So when you got your probation, you went to live in a Christian home. He said, yes, I found an old book in the dude's house. It was a Matthew Henry commentary on the Bible. Have you seen one of those bad boys? Yes, the Bible passages with a comment on each. Yes, I thought I would just read this thing, right? I read it from start to finish. It took me a couple months, but I read it. Any particular part that got to you? Yeah, I got converted reading the book of Romans. That's a cheeky book to get converted by. That tells you where he's from, using the word cheeky. Romans just resonated with me because I've been told lies my entire life, largely by social workers and drug counselors. They just lied to me blatantly. Well, what were the common lies? Well, the biggest lie is that I really wasn't a bad person. I was a good guy who had a terrible upbringing, a terribly abusive childhood. I was a product of my environment. So they're saying you're not responsible? Exactly. I'm the victim. But Paul tells me, no, you need to take responsibility for yourself and for your actions. Boo-hoo, you had a tough childhood. But you're a sinner standing in front of a holy God, and there's no excuse for your sin regardless of how people treated you. The interviewer goes on to say, there's a hymn in, in, called Amazing Grace that has the line, saved a wretch like me. Some people in the United States say, oh, we don't like to say wretched, so we changed the word to saved someone like me. But you had the understanding that you're a wretch. Well, yes, people who don't like the word wretch are wretches too, aren't they? Simple as that. Well, how do they come to understand they're wretches too? Well, you just tell them. <laughs> So what is showing the love of Jesus? What should that really look like? Well, showing the love of Jesus is proclaiming the truth of the gospel. Jesus came down because there's a sin problem. It doesn't matter that you live in a gated community or under a bridge. You're separated from a holy God. But here's the good news, baby. You can turn from your sinful lifestyle and put your trust in Christ the Lord for salvation. He will forgive you. That's the good news. In reading the story, I, I was... I was amazed that this guy had the time to sit down for an interview because it sounds like he was so poured into his community in trying to save uh, people. The very notion that we're good people, just misunderstood people, that's an affront to Scripture. 
It also minimizes the cancer of sin that lies in every person and ultimately separates us from God. And if you think about it, it also cheapens Jesus' death for our sins. It's as though we were not quite there, but Jesus completed us. He just pushed us over the edge. So what we often do to our demise is we combine flesh and spirit, and then we separate secular and sacred. When in fact we should be welding sacred and secular together, which will cause us to have Jesus first and foremost in every part of our life. Which will do one of two things. It will either cause us to drag Jesus into all the garbage that we entertain ourselves with and spend the rest of our lives trying to find excuses and justifications for why that's okay, or it'll cause us to realize we're missing out on what John calls life on life or abundant life. It's a spirit-filled life of joy that's contagious and causes the world to pause and take notice of us. I know the older battle-hardened saints in our church, they're nodding in approval. When I, I walk around the church sometimes, and there's like this group of folks that sit right in the back there, the, the older folks. The conversations they have, rich. Just for fun, if you don't want to introduce yourself, just sit next to one, just listen. <laughs> They talk about really neat things. They've experienced this. Now, as far as the flesh and the spirit, we should be constructing a crazy big wall to separate these two. And that's why we're here this morning. We're here to pick up a couple bricks and some mortar and build the wall. Your flesh didn't want to hear it come here this morning, did it? It's cold. But you told it, get in the car, we're going to church. Like, you talk to your kids. <laughs> Let's talk about the boast of the soul. When your soul boasts, it's all about the greatness of God. It's a life that's been transformed, put on display for all to see. When a soul boasts, people take notice. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says this, For we're the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, and the other for fragrance from life to life. A boasting soul has a fragrance. And it will be life to some and the smell of death to others. We don't get to choose the aroma. We're just living it out. That's the work of the Spirit. For those being saved, it's aroma of life. For those who aren't, it's the smell of death. Violent opposition to Christianity is a result of the fragrance of death for those who are perishing. Okay, the battle isn't ours. Right? We're, just, we're just walking this life of gratitude out, telling people about how wonderful our Lord is. People that don't want to hear that, it's death. I've never seen a more apt picture than what's going on today in, in our current abortion debate. As hideous as abortion is now, now infanticide's on the table. Venomous outbursts. This is the aroma, death to death. That's what it looks like. Living a righteous life is antiquated to some people. Who are you going to tell me? Who are you to tell me right from wrong? The boast of the soul is natural. It's a natural outbreak of joy from an inward change. The boast of the soul doesn't need an audience. Do you get that? It just happens. There's no one to impress the boast of the soul. The boast of the flesh, no audience, no boast. That's its fuel. The boast is fuel. I coach a boys' soccer team. I've got one kid on my team that cannot get enough of himself. He's addicted to himself. If I need any production out of him, I have to put him on the side of the field where all the audience, where all the crowd is. <laughs> then he plays hard. The humble shall hear and be glad. Who here likes to hear boasting of any kind? I don't think any of us like it. Few things are harder for me to listen to than someone going on and on bragging about whatever. When it's a Christian, it's pretty ugly. But when it's a non-believer, you gotta think about this. It's hard to hear, but it's a little bit easier when you realize that what their boast is all they have. They have to try to make sense of this world as best they can, to exalt themselves as high as they can. That's their end. That's all they have. With no hope of eternity, everything attainable that they can get here, whatever glory they can scrape together, it's short-lived, but that's all they have. I want you to take a moment and think about somebody you think is unreachable. Josh, you want to come on up? Think about somebody that you think is unreachable.
I'm going to tell you that one person you are thinking of is one tragedy away from an encounter with God because tragedy often equals humility. Don't give up on that person that you thought about. It takes humility to be glad when the soul boasts. Don't be intimidated. Celebrate the joy you have in Him. Celebrate it out loud. If you've been redeemed, say so. If He's made you new, talk about it. Your testimony, your soul's boasts, that's the answer to this wacky world we live in. Last, let's take a good look at this good day. And I know it's a good day because you're not required to pay for your own sins today. Let's shred this divide between sacred and secular. You cannot check Jesus at the door like you would check your Bible back in that you borrowed off the table in the back and pick it up next week. Acknowledge him into the rest of your life because he's already there. You might as well acknowledge him and learn to enjoy the peace and security that comes with a deep end relationship with him. Verse 8 of the same chapter, we didn't get that far. Obviously, I think we did two verses this morning. <laughs> It says to taste and see that the Lord is good. That single verse is another entire study on its own. Your soul longs for the goodness of God. Taste and see. If you're tired of trying to pay for your own sins, let's get that handled today. If you're tired of the division between sacred and secular, let's get that handled. If you're tired of living in fear, separated from God, time to handle it. If God's tugging at your heart this morning, you know it. You feel it. Don't worry about the people around you. It's between you and God. Josh is going ahead and play some more worship for us here. And the guys are going to come forward and take an offering. At this time, I want you to do two things. I want you to get it handled. You're redeemed. You don't have to live in fear. The temple veil is shredded by Jesus' blood. Nothing you did, nothing you can do. You owe nothing. A life of gratitude is all you have to give. And I forgot the second one. So Josh, go right ahead.